Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Joseph Betancourt, and I'm director of the Disparity Solutions Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. The Disparity Solutions Center is dedicated to the development and implementation of strategies that advance policy and practice to eliminate racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. I will be moderating today's panel of speakers. I want to welcome everyone to today's web, web seminar entitled New Approaches to Assess and Address Healthcare Disparities for the PCMH Model. This program is part of a series of webinars sponsored by the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative, including in partnership with the Center for Care Delivery and Integration and the Medical Home Development Group. Of note, I'd like to bring uh, to everyone's attention that the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative will be hosting their fall conference, The Journey to a PCMH Choose Your Path, on October 25, 2012, in Chicago, Illinois, at the Millennium Knickerbocker Hotel. As hospitals and health systems prepare for the challenges of health care reform, including changes in payment, accountability for population health and patient experience, and a greater focus on quality, there is a clear understanding that to be successful in the future, organizations must be prepared to provide effective, patient-centered, equitable care to diverse populations. As part of a national effort to improve quality, achieve equity, and eliminate disparities, leading organizations are now, are now preparing to improve quality and achieve equity. New approaches to assess and address healthcare disparities for the PCMH model will be essential to these efforts. To provide more details about today's webinar, I'd like to introduce Audrey Wetzel. But before I do this, just a couple of housekeeping notes. We will be taking questions from the audience throughout today's presentation. You can submit questions by typing them in the question box on your screen, making sure that you specify to whom the question is directed, if anyone in particular, and then hit submit question. Because of the large audience, we may not be able to get to all the questions. I'll be leading the audience Q&A during the last 30 minutes of this web seminar. Now to introduce Audrey Wetzel. Audrey is the co-founder of Resource Partners LLC, the parent company of Medical Home Development Group. She's a seasoned healthcare services executive with more than 20 years of progressive healthcare services experience directly tied to technology. In 2011, Resource Partners was selected as one of 57 companies selected by the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative for publication in their first resource guide, Putting Theory into Practice. Resource Partners LLC is currently working with several independent and hospital-based physician practices that are facilitating the NCQA PCMH accreditation process. Audrey is also involved with several electronic health information exchanges at the state and local levels, and she's received awards for outstanding leadership and volunteer services and has served on numerous boards. Audrey, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, we're going to be looking at some technology that supports uh, the patient-centered primary care collaborative initiatives as it relates to um, providing patient-centered medical home support services. Um, we're looking at today some technology that has been developed by two very different organizations. Um, and we're going to start out actually this afternoon with uh, Dr. Tom LeBeast and Cherie Wilson, and then we're, they're going to be followed by Dr. Charles Lee. Um, just to tell you a little bit about um, what we're doing in addition to what you just heard, um, we're continuing to support the initiatives of those practices, primarily physician-based organizations uh, that would like to not only strive to continue, but also strive to provide excellent primary care in a patient-centric environment. Um, these tools that we'll be observing today um, will not only allow organizations to set to self-assess, but also to address inefficiencies and gaps in the care delivery process. Um, our first presenters today is Cherie Wilson. Cherie is a faculty research associate with the Department of Health Policy and Management in Johns Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solutions at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. We also have Dr. Thomas Levise, who's also with Johns Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solutions. Um, Dr. Levise is director of the Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solutions at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And last but not least, we are going to hear from Dr. Charles Lee. Um, Dr. Lee is uh, one of the principals with Polyglot Systems. He's the founder and president 
Um, he's a board certified internal medicine physician as, and was a National Library of Medicine fellow at Duke um, University of North Carolina Medical Informatics program. Um, so without any further ado, I will um, introduce uh, Cherie Wilson and Dr. Thomas Labise, who's going to be talking about one of those tools that we are very much um, engaged with as an organization. And uh, for those that will be listening in on today's call, we'll note that uh, these tools will not only provide that needed support to health organizations, whether you're hospital-based or whether you're a primary care or physician-owned organization. So without any further um, discussion, we're going to now hear from Cherie Wilson and uh, Dr. Levesque. Or actually, I should say, we're going to start out with uh, Dr. Lee, I believe. I, I see the slide up on the uh, screen. So are we starting with Dr. Lee? I believe we're starting with... Um, yeah, we are. We are, yes. And actually, um, Audrey, I think you had a couple slides that you wanted to talk about on why this issue is important to the patient-centered medical home. There are a couple slides. Yes, okay. So we're going to, th the first slide that you see up on the screen before we start with uh, Cherie Wilson is that um, we're building homes, medical homes that help reduce health disparities. And so today's slides and those technologies that we were going to be reviewing, um, we're going to look at how those tools will help reduce health disparities in the medical home environment. Um, the PCMH holds considerable promise, as we all know, for improving health outcomes and reducing health disparities. Um, the lack of those adaptable tools within the patient-centered environment can certainly undermine PCMH's ultimate goals, and that is to improve individual as well as population health. The first tool that we're going to be reviewing today um, is the assessment tool. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we're going to look at technologies that not only assess but also address. Um, some of those gaps and inefficiencies within the healthcare arena, um, particularly in organizations that are striving to become patient-centric in their approach. And so with that, um, we're going to start out with the, a tool today that's going to look at the assessment, um, the continuous quality improvement approach, um, which is the uh, um, tool known as Clearview 360. Um, so with that, um, Dr. Thomas Labise, as well as Cherie Wilson will be presenting. And also, in addition to presenting some information about the tool itself, we'll also have an opportunity to um, demo some of those features that are inherent to the, the application. Yes, thank you very much, Audrey. Um, next slide, please. My name is Dr. Thomas Avise, and I'm director of the Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solution. We are a NIH-funded uh, Center of Excellence for the Minority Health and Health Disparities, uh, and we draw faculty and staff from uh, the various Johns Hopkins health institutions, including the School of Public Health, School of Medicine, and School of Nursing and Hospital. Um, the center was founded in 2002, uh, and we are now in our 10th year and very uh, happy to be have existed for 10 years. Uh, next slide. What we're going to be Next slide, please. What we're going to be doing in, in, in the brief um, time we'll have with you is going over some of the um, uh, factors that are uh, changes that are occurring within the, the United States that's motivating uh, this increased emphasis on cultural competency and health equity, uh, looking at demographic changes that are happening. Uh, we'll give a brief definition and just a discussion of cultural competency and say a bit about um, the regulatory environment and how it's moving towards uh, having a greater emphasis on trying to impact health equity and how the tool that we've developed has um, uh, can be used to help in that process. Cultural competency, just, uh, uh, just a little bit about my where I'm coming from with this, cultural competency has been around for uh, several decades now, and much of what we've done 
in, in this area has uh, focused on, uh, as a researcher, uh, and my, my perspective on the research in this area has been that much of it has been kind of think pieces and essays about what we ought to do. It's been much more aspirational and much less um, work done around developing an evidence base or developing concrete ways of measuring and um, cultural competency. And so my idea was, can we do something to develop a tool that, that we can actually use to determine whether or not we've um, achieve some level of cultural competency, understanding, as we'll see in a moment, that cultural competency is actually a process more so than a, more so than a, 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 than a it, it's sort of a, something that we aspire to and that we have to ultimately always be developing and continuing to, to evolve because culture is, is dynamic and always changing, but that we can at least begin to gauge where we are towards moving to some ideal level of cultural competency and then place it the way that we approach other things in the healthcare industry, which is through the use of a science-based process, can we apply the same methods to cultural competency? That is to measure it, identify where gaps may exist, intervene to try to improve those gaps, and then remeasure, which is the CQI process, which uh, Sheree Wilson will be describing. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. The United States has been going through a dramatic transition, a change in literally the face of the nation. The country is becoming a majority minority population. This slide shows the second half of the 20th century. And over that 50 year period, as you can see, there's been a dramatic shift where white non Hispanics in 1990 comprised, uh, 1950 comprised about 90% of the US population. But by the end of the century, that was about 70%. Next slide. The projections are that as we move into the 21st century, this pattern will continue and at some point in the middle of the century, we will become a minority, minority country. That is, the majority of the population in the United States will be people that we currently refer to as racial ethnic minorities. Next slide. Several, sli several states have already undergone that transition and several more, more, as we can see, are in the offing. Next slide. In addition, uh, in concert with this demographic shift, we see uh, increases in the proportion of U.S. residents that are non, uh, not born in the country. We see a dramatic rise in the number of, of, of people living in the country who, are, who have limited English proficiency or who speak of primarily speak other languages than English. And this has dramatic implications potentially for the healthcare industry, um, as we all know. Next slide. So cultural competence is um, a term that refers to ways that we try to address this. That is that as the patient population becomes more diverse, culturally diverse, not only in terms of race, ethnicity, uh, nationality, and uh, religion, all of these forms of diversity have implications for people's belief systems, their values, their behaviors, uh, language and communication. And um, so we try to apply this concept of cultural competency to help make the industry better able to to adjust to the changing dynamics of the patient population. So it's a developmental process that evolves over an extended period of time. Individuals, organizations, and systems are at various levels within this continuum. Next, next slide, please. So while it is the case that an individual can have training in cultural competency and an interest in becoming, as an individual, culturally competent, what we focus on in the work at the Hopkins Center for Disparity Solutions is not individual cultural competency, but rather organizational cultural competency. How do we des design and create organizational cultures that do the best possible job of meeting the needs of the, of the diverse patient populations that we're going to be seeing as we move forward in the 21st century? Next slide. So cultural competency competency requires that organizations have a defined set of values and principles and that they demonstrate behaviors, attitudes, policies, and structures that enable them to work effectively across cultures. 
Next slide. Um, as a part of this process, one would have a value for the for the diverse for diversity. Understand the importance of valuing diverse populations of patients that we see. We would be doing we would be conducting assessments, which is the way we approach other aspects within the healthcare industry. Uh, we we want to measure it. We want to be able to define it. We want to be able to to chart our progress. We want to also have processes in place to manage the dynamics and differences between the groups that we encounter. And we also want to engage patients, families, and communities so that we can keep uh, track of changes that are happening in the patient populations that we serve and be on top of those changes, but also be better able to more quickly uh, adjust as the patient populations change and as the needs of those populations change. It also it helps to build trust, helps to improve patient compliance, helps to improve patient outcomes, helps to reduce the um, wait times helps helps to uh, improve patients' efficacy, making patients more effective patients, which helps to make medical encounters more efficient, more effective, and improve outcomes for patients. Next slide. So we want to incorporate these into the, our policy making, into the administration, at, into the practice of service delivery, the way that we do business. And, and the key here is to, to engage stakeholders, patients, clients, their families, and also people in the community that you're serving, even if they are not patients, they are potential patients or potential clients. We want to engage all of these stakeholders and uh, be aware of these changes that are occurring in our community and be best prepared to address them. Next slide. Now, while these dynamics are, cha are happening within the, the, the country, within the society, we also have a changing regulatory environment. Uh, next slide. We have federal, local, as well as regulatory changes that are occurring that, that require that we attend to uh, cultural diversity among patient populations. And here are just a few examples going back to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. All, all through the creation of the class standards and NCQAs. Um, next slide. Go on to the next slide, please. NCQAs um, um, work in, um, in creating the multicultural health standards and distinction program for health plans, in addition to uh, meetings for use, electronic medical records, and of course, it is required as part of, it is one of the aspects of the patient center medical homes um, uh, uh, accreditation process at NCQA, URAC, as well as the Joint Commission to to engage cultural competency. Next slide. Um, in addition to the social justice argument, that is that we should address health equity because it's the right thing to do, we should also address uh, health equity because the regulatory, uh, regulatory bodies are beginning to require this. But there is also a compelling economic argument. This uh, uh, slide is from a report that, um, that my center produced uh, in 2008. We actually we did uh, economic analysis to calculate the economic impact of health inequalities and determined that when you combine the direct medical care costs, lost productivity within the economy, and premature death, that the cost of health inequalities exceeded $1 trillion. So there is a business case, in addition to there being the social justice argument, as well as the regulatory argument for why it's important that as an industry we begin to pay much more attention to it, to this topic, because this topic area will affect the bottom line. Next slide. We also find that um, business is beginning to see the importance of addressing health inequalities. This is a report from the National Business Group on Health that I served on this, uh, this committee as well, where we uh, did analysis of uh, some of the larger employers in the country and, um, and how they are addressing and, and addre uh, why they are, have become compelled to deal with health equity uh, because of its impact on their bottom line. Next slide. So the COA 360 was developed 
to measure cultural competency within healthcare organizations. The tool provides a 360 degree view of an organization and helps to identify places within the organization where change could be, where change might be effective and that, uh, and, and helps you to identify where you might want to make uh, interventions. Next slide. Next slide, please. So while there are other tools uh, that have been created, this tool is different because it's uh, um, web-based. Its ease of administration, I think, is different than the other um, tools that are out there, and that this tool, unlike the others, have gone through a, a rigorous, rigorous validation process, which culminated in the publication of this article that we have here. Next, next slide, please. Additionally, the tool was awarded the Innovation Award in 2008 from the National Center on Minority Health and Health Disparities of the National Institutes of Health, and uh, we're very proud of that, of course. Next slide, please. The COA 360, Clearview, 360, Clearview Organizational Assessment 360, has three versions. The COA 360U is a tool that assesses cultural competency for, for units or departments of an organization, usually a large hospital. So a hospital emergency room or other department within a hospital might use the tool, that tool. There is a COA 360H, which is a hospital-wide assessment tool, which is something that the entire hospital might do um, to get a gauge of where the organization is in general. And then there's the PCMH 360, which is the newest tool that we have, um, which is designed specifically for medical practices going for um, patients in a medical home distinction. And that tool is scheduled to be launched in the uh, spring of 2013. Next slide. Um, each of these tools share several characteristics. They are all web-based. Uh, it assesses healthcare organizations, not individuals, and I think it's important to stress that, that when we talk about cultural competency in this context, we're talking about the organization's cultural competency, not any in indiv given individual. Uh, it identifies strengths and areas for improvement, and it's suitable for any size healthcare organization. Uh, and it will measure the unique configuration of diversity in the service area, which includes race, ethnicity, language, religion, spirituality, and sexual identity. And in the case of the, um, the PCMH 360, there will be an even greater emphasis on patient satisfaction and other aspects of patient engagement. So it, it will have additional dimensions to it. Next slide. Um, the, the hospital tool, which is the, the, the what we're going to show you, uh, the, uh, the uh, demonstration we're going to do is of the hospital tool. And that tool focuses on the class standards, uh, um, the joint commission standards, as well as including the uh, HCAPS patient experience survey for hospitals. And as I said, uh, you can move to the next slide, please. And as I said, in the PCMH tool, we will include the uh, uh, CAPS survey for uh, um, practices. So when we say 360, we refer to this as the 360 degree view because we give a view of the organization from various constituency groups. Most of the other uh, tools have, uh, focus only on the administrator's perspective, but uh, and that is the tools that are for hospitals. But what I, and I'll tell you what we want to do is we want to get administrators clinical staff, non-clinical staff, as well as patients. And when we say clinical staff, we don't just mean physicians, but we, need, we mean anyone who is in a clinical uh, role, which could, which could mean um, um, physical therapists, uh, social workers, others that are doing any kind of clinical work, in addition to, of course, physicians and nurses. And non-clinical staff is any other staff member in the organization, the receptionist, the security guard, parking attendant, anyone who could possibly come into contact with patients. Um, and, um, and so the PCMH version will also uh, include 
uh, questionnaires for all of the various constituency groups. And of course, the patients, because patient engagement is a major focus of the PCMH tool. Uh, next slide. Yes, Sheree, I think you take over here. Yes, correct. Thank you, Dr. Luis. So we see all of this as part of the COA 360 continuous quality improvement process. And so the idea is that with an assessment, you conduct one to establish your baseline of performance. Once you receive your results, you would then be able to identify your deficiencies or your areas of improvement. Then you need to figure out, well, how am I going to address those deficiencies or areas for improvement? So you then need to tailor interventions you need to then implement, give them time to scale and spread, and then you will conduct a reassessment somewhere between 12 to 24 months, and then you start the process anew. So I'm going to go ahead, as Audrey mentioned, and give you a brief demo of the tool, and this is the COA 360H tool. We have five different surveys, the point of contact survey, we have the three different types of staff surveys, and then we have the patient client survey. As Dr. Levis mentioned, this is a web-based tool, so if you do have an email address, once you're uploaded to the system, you receive an email such as the one shown here, and you are provided with a link to complete the survey as well as your login. When you click on that link, you are brought to the home page, and you would log in with your email address, although we found that in many institutions, their non-clinical staff do not have email addresses, so they are not relegated to second-class citizenship and have to complete this on paper, we will then assign them a username where they can then complete the survey online as well at, say, a public workstation or a computer lab. Once one logs into the system, you then get a brief blurb about the survey and what it consists of, as well as the link to the survey. And then this little graphic is a visual of how far along you have are on the particular survey. One beauty of the tool, though, is that you don't have to complete it in a single sitting. It currently takes about 10 to 15 minutes for the staff to complete. And an assessment period could range anywhere, say, from two weeks to six weeks. We work individually with the clients to see what will suit their purposes, and then we will adjust accordingly. So this is an example of the point of contact survey. That's the person designated for the institution who is knowledgeable about the diversity of the organization, defined as racial, ethnic, religious, and language diversity. And that person is then asked to look and to provide a range. In this case, this is racial and ethnic diversity. And this is trying to show the range of people who fall into those particular categories. The idea behind this is that anecdotally, we may know that our institution doesn't reflect the diversity of our community. But until you actually see it graphically depicted, it doesn't always hit home. We ask questions about religious diversity, but we do ask also, too, what percentage of the patients, as well as those in the service area or the surrounding community, perhaps are limited English proficients, meaning these are the patients who are most likely to require the services of an interpreter, as well as what percentage of staff, both clinical and non-clinical, are multilingual, meaning that they potentially could serve as bilingual staff. And according to both the Joint Commission standards and the class standards, they could only serve as bilingual staff if their competency in both English and the target language had been assessed and they had received additional training. Next, we have the staff surveys. And the questions are the same for all three surveys, but when you see the sample report, you'll see that the results are reported out based upon on the survey that one completed. So we ask questions about the background of the person, such as how long they've worked in healthcare versus how long they've worked in that particular institution. Because we know that from a teamwork and communication culture perspective, you might have worked in the industry for a very long time, but if you're new to the organization, you might not yet have adopted the norms and behaviors that are expected, which can influence and perhaps adversely impact the culture of the organization. We ask background questions such as, do they feel qualified to conduct a medical encounter in a language other than English? We ask questions about gender, race, ethnicity, as well as religious affiliation and what country they were born in and this is all pulled into the overall reports. Across the top here, you'll see steps two through five, and what we've done is we've taken the class standards, we've assigned a domain name to each of those class standards, and we've created a series of questions that would then roll up to that particular domain. So here we have four questions related to promote equity and quality, and then a domain score is produced based upon the responses. And we have questions related to language services, who provides them, is the proficiency of those staff. Um, is that assessed? 
our particular materials translated into various languages. And then we also ask about various policies, governance and leadership, and all of this rolls up into whether an organization is culturally competent. Because we all know that every organization has policies and procedures that are in place, but if there is no accountability for abiding by those policies and procedures, or if staff simply aren't aware of those policies, then how well are we going to operate as an organization? Moving on to the patient survey, we also ask questions about the patient's or client's background. We also do ask what, com what language they feel most comfortable speaking to their healthcare team. And then to get a little bit at the health literacy issues, we do ask what their highest grade or schooling is that has been completed. Now, realizing this is not an exact one for one, this is very helpful information to have because we need to know how we can communicate to our patients or clients in plain language. You'll see, though, that for the patients, they complete a slightly shorter survey because we ask them a subset of the questions asked of staff. So you'll recall that when we looked at the staff survey, the domain Promote Equity and Equality had four questions. Well, for the patients, we have two questions because patients wouldn't be knowledgeable about the specific policies and procedures, but they can then respond to the questions that would be applicable to them. We also ask both the staff and the patients about patient satisfaction, discrimination bias, as well as perceptions of patient or client trust. Whereas we ask the staff to predict how the patients will respond, we actually ask the patients to provide their responses. And th these uh, three sections are stratified by race, ethnicity, and language, and religion. And as Dr. Levice mentioned, we also provide a modified HCAPS survey at the end of the section for the patients, and we ask them to rate their nurses, their doctors, as well as the staff. And this also will be stratified by race, ethnicity, language, as well as religion. So I'll briefly cover um, some aspects of a sample report. One beauty of the tool is that because this is all electronic based, as soon as the assessment period has been ended and all of these surveys have been completed, we just click a button and this PDF report is uh, released. And what's great about this is that you then have a timely response to the survey completion because I know from a patient safety and quality perspective, the longer you move away from the assessment period, the less likely it is that people are to use that information. And staff also become very upset if they complete surveys and don't actually get to see the results. So the report has three sections. And the first section is based upon the points of contact responses. The second section is based upon the background questions that were answered by both the respondents and the patients. But the meat of the report is the performance domain summary. And I'll give you a couple of samples of that. We also ask that we show you here what are the percentage of people who have completed the survey in the various roles. So here, this is based upon the point of contacts perception. So this is showing us here, look at chart three, that for the black or African American community, the patient base is thought to be 41 to 60 percent black or African American, but the senior leadership and the clinical staff is not mirroring the, is not mirroring the diversity of the patient base or even the surrounding community. And what we'll get is, is, well, you know, we work in a really diverse organization. Well, it may be diverse, but it's only diverse at the lowest levels of the organization, so specifically the non-clinical staff. So turning to the performance domain summary again, looking at promote equity and quality, the results are reported out in five different ways. There is an employee average, which is indicated by the red, the administrator responses in green, clinical in purple, non-clinical in yellow, and blue for the patients. And what we do is we provide a couple of bullet points of some suggestions that are customized based upon the rankings that will help the organization get started to improve that particular domain. And as I mentioned, for the domains of patient satisfaction, discrimination bias, and patient or client trust, we do stratify by race, ethnicity, religion, as well as language. So you can see more fully, this is showing us that um, for some reason the black or African American and the Latino Hispanic populations are either somewhat or very dissatisfied with the organization, whereas the white population is very satisfied or somewhat satisfied. So I would advise an organization that you perhaps need to conduct focus groups with those two patient populations as well as the community to find out what the issues are because you can't create interventions if you don't know what you're trying to address. And as I mentioned, we also break out these responses or stratify by language as well as religion because we know these can also impact as well patients' perceptions of the treatment they've received. And a little bit about the satisfaction regarding the use of the tool. So um, regarding satisfaction with the COA360 overall, 
we've only had 5% of people saying that they strongly disagree. And these results come from an optional user experience survey that the survey respondents can complete after they've completed their particular survey. As far as satisfaction with the CUA 360 functionality, 4% strongly disagree or disagree, but otherwise our numbers are very high. As far as usability, 3% strongly disagree or disagree. Again, otherwise the numbers are very positive. And as far as qualitative results, so several of the clients who have completed said that the report and the assessment process allow them to learn their performance in a variety of domains. And as you can see, again, from that continuous quality improvement cycle, they were able to determine targeted interventions so they can improve their care to all of their clients. This was one particular unit that wanted to roll out an educational program to the entire hospital, but they piloted it first on the labor and delivery unit. Before they started that pilot, they completed an assessment, and they're actually currently reassessing as we speak. And based upon the success of, or the results actually, of this reassessment, they will determine whether or not that pilot was a success and whether they should roll it out hospital-wide. And then lastly, another client said that the assessment and the report was innovative, user-friendly, and easy to use by all aspects of their patients and their staff, and that the reports were meaningful. And a lot of our clients actually mirror or marry this information with their patient experience data, their quality data, employee engagement, as well as their patient safety data. And now I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Lee. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, hopefully, are you able to see my screen? Yes, looks fine. Thank you. So polyglot systems, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the word, what the word polyglot means to speak many languages. So you know, once you've gone through the assessment and identified that you have significant language barriers or health literacy barriers, you know, what can you actually do about it? You know, obviously, uh, having uh, bilingual uh, staff people can speak that language is very helpful. But oftentimes, you don't have the resources, either written information or other communication tools to actually impact um, patient care. So one of the things that we're focused on is how can we improve health through helping patients understand. And this means that we really need to engage the consumers. And how can we engage the consumers if they have difficulty understanding health information or uh, challenges with language barriers? So why is this important? Um, according to the Institute of Medicine, about 90 million people in the United States have issues with low health literacy. And another 30 million have limited English proficiency according to the most recent uh, US Census statistics. So practically what this means is that if you use the example of prescriptions and you know, most of you probably realize that medication are the leading cause of medical mistakes in the United States. These two populations represent about one third of the U.S. population, which means that if there are four billion prescriptions being written every year, about one and a half billion are being written to patients who may not adequately understand how to take those medications appropriately. So this is a significant issue although we don't really talk about it because this is uh, oftentimes uh, discussed behind the scene. So if you look at this particular challenge, if you go to a pharmacy and pick up a medication recently, you will get uh, something that looks like this, and this is called the uh, Consumer Medication Information Sheet. And this is what's being given to patients now when they pick up the medicine. And oftentimes this is written at about a six-point font size, it's really dense, and also, although this is designed for consumers, it's really not for consumers. This is actually to get the legal folks off their back and say, we gave them information. So you know, are we doing enough to make sure that we are giving patients the type of information that they need to do, uh, make healthcare decisions and act appropriately? So one of the things that we focused on is you know, trying to develop solutions to leverage technology Although human resources are great, oftentimes they are really difficult to scale at other organizations and, and maybe the Hopkins or the Mayo's or the Cleveland Clinic can afford to have a lot of these resources. Most organizations do not have the financial capability and are limited in what they can do. So what we wanted to do was to identify technology-based solutions that can be scaled 
and made readily accessible um, to every healthcare organization throughout the United States. And four technologies that I want to briefly show you today. One is called Medication, which is designed to make uh, easier medication instructions available to patients. Calendar is designed to um, simplify adherence by giving them easy to follow uh, regimens based on a visual representation of all their meds and the dosing schedule. Time view is actually designed for healthcare professionals to provide um, medication intelligence back to the, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the physician about what's actually happening with the patient. Oftentimes we are prescribing in the dark, you know, we're just shooting, um, thinking we're adding medicine on top of medicine, but we're really not understanding whether the patient are taking the medicine, you know, whether they switched or if they're on other medicines that could be conflicting with them. So time view is just designed to provide that intelligence back to the healthcare provider to provide feedback to make appropriate decision making around medications. And third, the last one I want to show you is a, is a new one um, that's being developed called Medication DC, and we're going to be coming alive with the data this uh, upcoming month. And this is to improve transitions of care by simplifying dis discharge instructions, uh, making this a low health literacy version, really easy to read and to understand, but at the same time, supporting other languages as well to reduce hospital uh, readmission. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump on really quickly and run into these programs to show you how this works. So this is the first program called Education. And right now I'm going to show you the standalone version, which is deliverable over the web. But uh, this is designed to be integrated into the pharmacy management system and EHR systems. This currently supports 16 different languages, uh, which includes English, Spanish, Mandarin, Chinese, and both traditional and simplified written forms. Cantonese, Korean, Haitian Creole, Italian, French, Arabic, uh, Russian, um, Bengali, Polish, Swahili, Somali, Karen, and Burmese. We can add additional languages uh, fairly easily. So what would happen is that the healthcare professionals would sign in uh, using our uh, sign-in process. And the key features appear at the top here. I'm not going to go through all of them. I want to do show, want to show you the our uh, ability uh, called Rx generator. And when we look at these consumer medication information sheets to see, well, how can we translate this information into other languages, we realized that the information in English was really, really not helpful. Um, to give you a real world impact, <clears throat> um, somebody asked me to make sure I tell you the story about my grandmother. So in addition to my medical background and my informatics background, I'm also a first generation Korean immigrant and I came to the United States when I was seven years old. And I had a grandmother out in Los Angeles who didn't speak uh, English very well. And, uh, you know, I went to visit her uh, many years ago. And uh, you know how we're all, you know, kind of interested in what the conditions that our parents and grandparents had. So went to the kitchen table and noticed that there were four pill bottles. And to the outside of the pill bottle was a piece of paper with Korean handwriting that I couldn't read because it had been such a long time and was taped to the outside of the pill bottle. So I was very interested and I asked her about this. And she says that she goes to the doctor, the doctor tells her stuff that she really doesn't understand and the doctor gives her a script which she knows to take to the pharmacy. She goes to the pharmacist, hands the pharmacist a script, the pharmacist doesn't talk to her and hands her pill bottle with instructions written in English. And then she um, walks out not knowing how to take the medicine and then she goes to find somebody in her apartment complex who um, can translate that information for her, and they write it on a piece of paper and they stick it to the office of the pill bottle. So this is what's happening to patients who have difficulty understanding English because our current system does not support these types of information. And if you think about um, these vulnerable population and the potential for medication errors, it's a really, really significant issue. So what medication is designed to do is to address or create a tool for both pharmacists and clinicians um, to uh, develop and, and hand these resources to the, to the consumers. Medication is designed to address four different things. One is obviously the health literacy issue, by simplifying information we give to patients. The second is the, um, the ability to uh, do this in other languages. The third component has to do with the readability of the document by being able to support multiple font sizes so that our elderly patients can give be given something in larger font sizes. And the fourth component has to do with 
um, making sure that patients understand how to use certain complex medications by visually showing them how to do those things. So very quickly, what I want to show you is how this works uh, as a standalone. But obviously, you will see that this is very comparable to an existing e-prescribing solution so that this could be very quickly integrated into systems. So the first thing we ask is, you know, what is the dose? How often this medicine should be taken? You can select anything you want, but the yellow highlights the most common way that this is prescribed and finally the number of refills. So what this does at the end is to say this is Acupro tablet 10 milligram. This medicine is used to treat high blood pressure. Take the medicine by mouth once a day. Take one pill each time. And you should keep taking this medicine until you're told to stop. And then you'll notice this. So for those of you who are not familiar with the universal medication schedule, what the Institute of Medicine discovered is that over 90% of medicines can be standardized into dosing into four different times a day. And that if you can represent the dosing and timing of those uh, medications, that you will reduce some types of medication errors. So to give you an example, um, one that's fairly concrete, um, one of the phrases they used was the phrase, take two pills twice a day. Now, that sounds relatively simple, except for the fact that some people thought it meant two pills in the morning, two pills at night for a total of four pills a day. Other people thought it meant one pill in the morning, one pill at night for a total of two pills a day. So take two pills twice a day is not a clear instruction. And what they said was that if you can represent the times of day and the number of pills to be taken each time, so they would say take the medicine by mouth twice a day, take two pills each time, that that would reduce those kinds of mistakes. So instead of giving the patient all this, um, the crap that's in the CMI sheet, we're focused on the key information that they should be aware of to use this medication appropriately. And then when I click accept, it shows up on the right-hand side. And then I can click on this little piece of paper to view this information in any of the languages that I support. And one of the things I want to emphasize here is that what you're seeing here is not machine translation. These are phrases that have been identified for various um, medication routes and forms, translated ahead of time, verified by a second translation agency. And what we're able to do is assemble these in real time uh, for a specific patient. The second medicine I want to show you is for a medicine called Floridil. So Floridil is one of these dry powdered inhalers that comes in a box, it's taken twice a day, Let's say it's for the COPD to use it until the total stop and let's give them one refill. So again, this says one puff in the morning, one puff in the evening. And the first instruction you'll see says that this capsule needs to be placed into the inhaler before it's use. Please follow the instructions for your inhaler carefully. Do not swallow the capsule. So the problem with this particular medicine is that it comes in the box. And inside this box is this little blue plastic device and a bunch of capsules and blister packs. And you're supposed to take a pill out of the blister pack, put it in the, uh, this little device, pierce the capsule, and then you're supposed to inhale the powder. But what really happens is that the doctor doesn't have this medicine in the clinic to show them how to use it. And when they go to pick it up at the pharmacist, you know, the pharmacist may not have the time or the patient may not have the ability to stick around. So what happens is the cashier has it in the bag, hands the bag with the box to the patient, and she asks, do you have any questions? The patient doesn't know what question to ask, so they, they say no. They go home, open up this box, and inside this box is a bunch of capsules that they've been swallowing it instead. So if you see this little warning sign, the warning sign means that there's a FDA medication guide associated with it because there's been problems. So you will see that it, do not swallow the capsules is a major problem. So how do we address this issue? And what we can do is, you see this little TV? By clicking on this little TV, it indicates that there's a demonstration for Florida, and I can now show to my Cantonese speaker how to use Florida the medication. Airlines are coming up again, don't forget to use So it's a step-by-step -step process of how do you use it, how do you clean it, and so on. So what I can then do is to print this information <coughs> in any of the um, supportive font sizes, so the large is for elderly patients, extra large is for patients with visual impairments, and this will be given to my patient in Cantonese. And in the upper left corner, you'll see that there's a, a barcode and a unique identifier, and this is what the patient can use once they select a language from our front screen 
will, the first thing they ask you is please enter the identifier and they'll be able to view the demonstration and review this information from home. So what this is trying to do is to create a very simple process of generating customizable, simplified patient information, information um, sheets for uh, multiple languages, be able to add visual representation that the patient can review from home, and be able to do this in a very simple, uh, quick manner, especially if this could be integrated into existing EHRs. So one other thing that I want to show you, uh, the second component I mentioned at the very beginning um, after education was the calendar. So right now what I've shown you is individual information for each uh, medication. So if somebody is on multiple medications, how can we simplify that uh, medication regimen to improve adherence? So what I'm going to do is clear this out and then show you an example um, of a multi-drug regimen. So here's an example where I have uh, about 10 medications, and I want to be able to do this in, um, to simplify a, a summary. So we have this feature called Calendar. And what Calendar does is to utilize the universal medication schedule grid to incorporate all of their medicines, be able to organize all of their morning medications, the dosages, evening medications, and the reason why they're on the medication. So if you think about medication therapy management or being able to do this uh, as a way to review medications during medical interventions, this is what this is designed for. So if I now wanted to go ahead and print this in simplified Chinese, I'm able to print this and then give it to my patient to take with them. Uh, we're also developing a consumer portal for this application as well. So if they uh, discontinue a medicine or they add um, over-the-counter medications, they'll be able to update this list, which would then be viewable uh, with privileges back to their healthcare provider. So that's the very quick uh, uh, overview of medication. And I have like four minutes to show you the other two applications. I'm going to do it very, very quickly. The second application um, that I want to show you is the time view application. And this is the uh, um, medication adherence intelligence that I was talking about before, where the healthcare provider can get feedback uh, about patients' adherence. And what this timeline is able to do is to actually pull medication information from either uh, uh, pharmacy fill data or short scripts claims data and the e-prescribing uh, prescription data and overlap it on top of each other. And we can then group the medicines by chronic, as needed, and acute medicines, with the chronic being the most important, obviously, because of adherence issues. And instead of looking at um, information that looks kind of like this, which is what a lot of EHR system does, we're able to visually represent this across a, a, a timeline so that you can quickly see that in the middle of June, um, this person got a 28-day uh, fill for azithromycin. They filled it again in the middle of December, and in fact switched to 84 days. White space means that there should have been time when the patient actually ran out of the pills. So you know, overall, this patient isn't too bad. And it looks like they switched from one form of ferrosulfate to another form of ferrosulfate. And it looks like they've been aspiriva, and then they discontinued in early October. So this is a very quick way of understanding the compliance, who's prescribing, what they're taking, and how often they're missing or having these significant gaps. So this, again, is the, uh, the time view method of looking at medication adherence um, to intelligently modify and update um, their medication regimen. The last one I wanted to show you is the one for discharge instructions. And again, uh, this is coming out in uh, beta form uh, next month. And if you are interested, um, shoot me an email, and I'll get you signed up for this. But this is also funded by the National Institute for Minority Health and Health Disparities, as well as the education tool. So once we are able to identify a particular person uh, what we can do is select whether they're either teen or a uh, child, select a condition, so I can come in and select condition to heart failure, and if I wanted to, I can then return a document with, a, um, with uh, information geared for low health literacy, which uh, describes their condition um, and has a pre-made template of activity related to eating and drinking, instructions, medicines, call if, return if, which is fairly standard. Where we differ, is that we can now add patient-specific information. For instance, I can now come in and say, uh, we need to see you again in one week. 
after that, your next appointment with us is on the 26th at 12, 10 p.m. So I've made this um, relevant, I've made this actionable, and now I can add more specific information related to walking. I can add, try to walk 10 minutes three times a day and to slowly increase the amount that they walk. I may want to uh, add information about doing light chores, but not heavy chores. And then I can come in, select the other language that I want to create this in, uh, select dual column as my format, select a different font size. And here again, I can create an instruction that is now dual column format, here for low health literacy, supporting this other language, and then having patient-specific uh, actionable items uh, within this. So with that being said, I've met my two o'clock deadline, so um, I will hand it back over to Joe. Great, thank you so much uh, for both of those informative uh, presentations. Uh, just a note to the audience that we will be taking questions from you uh, at this point, and you can submit questions by typing them in the question box on your screen. Again, making sure that you specify to whom the question is directed, if anyone in particular, and hit submit question. Again, we'll try to get uh, to as many questions uh, as we can, and we have a couple here already that I'm going to uh, uh, share with uh, our presenters here. So uh, I, I want to begin uh, with uh, Tom. Tom, there's a question here, uh, two questions that, that relate to the cost uh, cost issue uh, around cultural competence and disparities. One's a very basic question. Uh, someone wants to know how to get a, a copy of the economic burden report. But then they ask, is there a connection between revenue and cultural competency? So. I wanted to know if you might uh, give that some thought and provide some comment there. Hello. If, uh, if you go to the center's website, you can get a copy of the report, hopkinshealthdisparities.org, or you can certainly contact me directly and I'll, I can send it to you. Um, and the cost of health disparities, the question is to whom? So I, I think that there are costs. We haven't yet done a study of a particular healthcare organization or practice to, to identify those costs, but if you consider um, the cost that we, um, that we charted in the national study was, was a cost of direct medical care, that is um, use of services that otherwise would not have occurred had there not been a, you know, people sicker than they ought to be, you know, that, that there would be um, some cost there. There's certainly lost revenue. Uh, there was a study that I was involved in a few years ago. We looked at use of cardiac catheterization in hospitals and found that because of under, um, under referral, uh, that patients that were appropriate candidates for catheterization were not referred. Uh, and they should have been, which, is a, which was a significant disparity problem from the standpoint of the patient's health and outcomes. But it also is an economic issue that the hospitals should have been able to charge for a service that was medically indicated and, and that they had the ability to, to, um, to provide and the patients had the ability to pay for, but they did not uh, make those referrals and therefore did not generate that revenue. That's a great example. Sheree, did you want to add something there? Yes, yes, if you wouldn't mind. So I was also going to take a slightly different bent on that. Thank you, Dr. Luis, for that response. Um, so also, too, because it was talking about the connection between revenue and cultural competency. So a couple of things. So from a marketing perspective, um, Dr. Luis had talked about service area, community surrounding that particular institution. So if you're not providing culturally competent care, so if you're not respecting your patient's health care beliefs, so you're not providing language access services, that word's going to get out in the community and they're not going to come to your institution. So that's one way you potentially could lose revenue. From another um, perspective, if we're talking about from a hospital, this would be your avoidable readmissions. And so if you're not providing culturally competent care and also to say your discharge instructions aren't in a manner where the level of health literacy is such that people can understand how to take care of themselves once they're home, they would then return to your hospital, but you're not going to be um, basically accruing that particular revenue. And then from a continuity of care perspective, is that more and more care is taking place in an outpatient setting 
as well as in a home setting. So if you're not providing culturally competent care in language that's understandable to all of your patients, again, this is affecting all patients from the language access side to the health literacy side, again, you may be losing revenue in that regard. Those are great points. I, I would just add as well that if we look at uh, the Institute of Medicine report crossing the quality chasm and we look at all the key pillars of quality, certainly we see that being inattentive to uh, issues, uh, some of the root causes that lead to disparities, whether it be low health literacy, mistrust, low general literacy and the like, we see examples such as uh, more medical errors with greater clinical consequences among minority populations. That certainly has uh, a cost component to the healthcare system. Uh, we also see that minorities receive less evidence-based care uh, with several studies that, that Tom has cited and certainly uh, as well tend to wait longer for the same clinical procedure, renal transplantation, uh, a good example with an incredible cost there to the healthcare system. Uh, and recent studies, even within the last few years, uh, when we think about where we're going with healthcare reform and payment reform, I think shed a light on the importance of these issues as it relates to healthcare system change. Uh, data telling us that minorities tend to have longer lengths of stay for the same clinical condition than their white counterpart, in part due to communication sensitive issues and informed consent and other factors, as well as minorities more likely to be readmitted with congestive heart failure inside 30 days than their white counterparts. Certainly that's an important piece of the puzzle as we move towards financial disincentives for readmissions uh, for hospitals. And as, re as it relates to the patient-centered medical home, without a doubt, our move towards accountability, accountable care organizations and the patient-centered medical home, our capacity to prevent avoidable hospitalizations and provide care in communities and strong primary care is critically important. And today, the, across the landscape, we see that minorities are more likely to be admitted with ambulatory care-sensitive conditions slash avoidable hospitalizations than their white counterparts. So I think uh, to Thomas Reed's point, there is a lot of uh, costs here that we don't take into account uh, that uh, certainly can be uh, saved and uh, a lot of waste uh, and inefficiency by being inattentive to cultural competency uh, and the root causes of disparities. Uh, Dr. Lee, I want to uh, turn it to you as well. Clearly, there's an incredible focus right now on the issue of adherence. We know that, for example, in the area of hypertension, about 50% uh, of, only 50% of hypertensives are uh, at uh, target. And these are individuals, for the most part, that have medications uh, in their home. Uh, adherence has become a real big target. Recent Institute of Medicine report highlighting the issue of waste and inefficiencies and talking about our uh, capacity to improve adherence as a key strategy here. Can you comment a bit about how important this is and I think you know what your tool adds in, in this regard? I mean, it's hugely important. I think um, as we move forward toward uh, pay for performance and making sure that you know we're getting reimbursed on, on health outcomes, the, the lack of focus on patient communication in the past, we've left a lot of the responsibility on the shoulders of the patient. So, for instance, at CMIC, we give it to the patient, and, and it's up to the patient to figure out how to do it. I think we need to develop more tools to kind of guide them through this process. And this is one of the reasons why I believe that you know, those, um, the calendar adherence summaries are, are really important because it's the focal point for having that conversation about, uh, well, you know, this is what I see our system says your medications uh, you should be taking. And they may say, well, you know, I don't take this, I don't take this. So it could be opening up that discussion and then making sure that everybody's on the same page. And by being able to have some a, form, uh, a summary like that that they can stick on the refrigerator door, I think it's going to be a really important element to making sure that they're adhering to their medications. Fantastic. I have a, a quick follow-up uh, question here uh, for you, Dr. Lee. The question is: um, Have any of the of have any of uh, this has any of this patient education software, uh, education as an example, been embedded to an EHR product, uh, or does the provider have to do dual data entry? Okay, so um, that is the goal, and that has been the goal from the very start. Um, but before we can get there, number one, we had to demonstrate what the heck we're trying to do uh, with leveraging this technology. And one of the things, if you've ever tried to talk to uh, these EHR vendors, uh, there has not been much emphasis on patient-centered communication. There's a lot of focus on features and exchanging data and security, uh, but you know, patient communication has not been at the top of their list. And for those who you know are using Epic or Cerner or whatever, they have these priorities and you know the top priorities for the year, and oftentimes those 
parties are not geared toward patient communication. So our system is designed to be integrated, but our next challenge is, is getting these EHR vendors to appreciate the importance of, of what we're trying to do. And what they are asking is that if consumers or the consumers, I mean, they're people that are using their system. So healthcare providers who are paying them to use their system, they want to hear from them to say, this is something that we are interested in. And what we're trying to show is what's possible. Uh, there are a lot many things that, that we can do, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a complete cycle. Uh, so before, it's the chicken and the egg. So before we can get integrated, they want to hear from their users that this is something that they want. Got it. Okay. Uh, Dr. Levy's question here uh, for you. And the question is, have there been any, correl have any correlations been discovered between declining uh, minority health, or I, I would say health disparities in general, and the small population of minority health care providers available to provide care to a growing minority population? Yeah, there have been, uh, yes, there have been a number of studies that have addressed the question of whether or not um, minority health care providers provide, uh, or can effectively address health disparities, uh, essentially is where I'd look at it. Um, most of those studies, and in fact, we've done a couple of those studies here in our center, um, the studies have been on looking at outcomes like patient satisfaction, um, uh, utilization of health services, um, uh, or, and even uh, uh, patient orient patient underuse of services that are available. And we, fi we did find correlations. So we did find that when patients had minority providers and they were, uh, minority patients had minority providers, they were they report higher levels of satisfaction, they're more likely to utilize services, and more likely to be compliant. What we don't have are studies that use harder outcomes, like uh, health status outcomes. There was one study published a few years ago in New England Journal that uh, they tried to do that with cardiac catheterization, but there were, uh, at least in my estimation, many methodological problems with the, uh, with the article, that I, so I don't really... Uh, I only mention it in case anyone on the call may have uh, seen it, but there is a paper that did that. With, I, think, I believe it actually was cardiac catheterization referral, but um, there were a lot of met methodological problems with the article, so I don't know that we can really put much stock in that in those results. Great, thank you. And can you also, uh, either you and or Shuri mention how uh, the COA tool tries to make some assessment of diversity I know you talked about it a bit, but uh, to talk a bit about how the, the tool is able to kind of look at diversity and, and what, you know, how important that is in, in uh, providing uh, organizations feedback. I'll, I'll turn this one over to Cherie. Sure, great. Thanks. I'll take that one. So yes, um, so I give you a really ultra quick demo of the tool. So what we're trying to look at for diversity is because diversity is very broad. So we're trying to do two things. One is to help the institution recognize the diversity within its institution. So that's where we're looking at asking the point of contact, what's that person's perception of race, ethnicity, language and religious diversity of the institution. And I know Doc, Dr. Betancourt, your center has done wonderful work regarding um, how to collect this data, how to actually present it via a dashboard. And so we realize that though many institutions are aren't that far along with this. So they might not even be aware of any of this information because you're getting it from different systems, staff versus patients. But then we also want to make sure that the people who are responding to the surveys are reflective of the diversity of the organization. So for one thing, when we look at the language access questions, if you're only having responses from your English-speaking patients, of course you're going to score well and look wonderful because those patients, if they see everything in English, that's fine. So we highly and strongly encourage people when they're doing these assessments to oversample their diverse patient populations. So you might want to go back and look at your last 30 to 6 months worth of discharges or patient encounters, identify patients who would be more diverse, and get, try to strongly encourage them to complete the survey so that you're getting an accurate de depiction of your institution. And then the last thing I'll say, too, is, again, that whole point of contact survey is perception because we realize not everyone has the real data readily available. But you saw the question that asked about the service area or community surrounding. Our idea, though, is that if an organization gave us these particular zip codes or considered our market area, we would then pull the actual race ethnicity data from the 2010 census data and incorporate that into the report as well. So you could then see perception versus reality. 
Great. That's fantastic. A wonderful tool and really appreciate that feedback. Uh, you uh, both have been very involved in, in piloting and uh, rolling the COA tool out. And I was wondering if you could just provide uh, our listeners with some key lessons learned uh, about uh, your experience so far. Sure. Uh, Dr. Lee, did you want to take that or you want, to, you want me to take that? You can go first. Go ahead. Okay, sure. Yeah, so some key lessons learned is the importance of getting leadership buy-in before actually conducting an assessment, mm -hmm. making sure that the key players are at the table. Because you kind of saw this was a super short overview presentation. We usually will do this when someone expresses interest. But then once they say we actually want to do the assessment, we actually will go over them. These are the expectations. These are the steps. These are some of the high points. These are some of the lessons learned. But Basically, if the people who are responsible for helping this assessment to be conducted aren't at the table, that's going to influence the results. Because even if it's a high-performing area or high-performing units, if that person's not at the table, that message isn't going to then be disseminated to their staff and the patients that they actually should be encouraged to participate. Um, another thing, too, is making sure, again, that you have the representation from the diverse patient population. And so it's not just one particular group of patients. Another big thing is that now that you've done the assessment, what do you do with the data? Because as I mentioned, this isn't meant just to be a check the box task. So, okay, we've done the assessment. Oh, we don't like the results, so someone hides the results. And then five years later, someone asks, well, didn't we do an assessment at some point? Oh, yeah, that's in so-and-so's office. We really want this to be a living document, a living tool. So once you receive the results, we're working then with the organizations to create action plans, helping to develop evidence-based interventions, sharing them with others, and so that we can really, really move things forward regarding culturally competent patient-centered care for all patients. Great. And I also say, I think, uh, one thing I've gotten to learn about the tools is the, the capacity for benchmarking. And so organizations can benchmark uh, against each other and also look at progress over time, which I think is, a, is a, uh, uh, an important uh, aspect of what you bring to the table. Right. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Lee, question for you about your experiences w with your tools. Uh, these tools, I think, to anybody who looks at them, uh, you know, would find them as absolutely wonderful and necessary. Uh, but what has been the kind of a, some of the uh, uh, successes around implementation and some of the challenges, and, and how do you think these could be addressed? Well, I think uh, one of the challenges to doing anything like what we're doing is that it tends to be disruptive. It's a disruptive technology, which means that we're asking people to do things a little bit differently. And I guess one of the most significant challenges is integrating this into workflow. So working with existing EHR vendors or uh, pharmacy management systems to, to build this in. And there are various ways that we can um, make this happen, uh, whether we're working with third parties or the vendors directly, or even um, uh, companies that are pipes like uh, Shorescripts. So uh, probably that's probably the most significant part of this. I think the vast majority of people who see our technology um, you know, say this is a no-brainer. But there's a, you know, there's a lot of things that are no-brainers, but it's can you execute and actually implement this into practice. And uh, one of the things we're trying to avoid is cost as a barrier. So implementing this as a technology that can be repurposed for lots of different purposes, whether it's at the pharmacy, at the clinic, or at the time that they're being discharged, is something that you know we're trying to implement. Um, but I would say the most significant challenge is the uh, the integration with uh, with um, EHR vendors and and getting this into workflow. And uh, how about for some of your other tools? I mean, are those cross cutting challenges, or uh, some of the other tools you mentioned? Is it, are those some of the similar issues that you face? Um, I think they all pretty much come down to that uh, because uh, you know, we had the challenges around um, you know, visually demonstrating at the counseling session. So you know, if you, if you want to implement this at pharmacies but they don't have a counseling area or they don't have an internet connection, um, you know, it can, each organization can represent challenges. But usually it, it comes down to uh, making sure that this is not too disruptive to what they're doing now. Um, because the patients really, and also the ROI from a business perspective, if you're trying to regulate compliance for health disparities, we believe the hammer doesn't necessarily work. Uh, at least it doesn't work well in that 
we're creating a sustaining effort on the part of the people who are trying to implement that. I think if you can justify to, for instance, the pharmacy to say, you know, we've shown that patients who receive this in Chinese, in, for instance, Chinatown, are more likely to tell their friends and family to come to that pharmacy, I think that's the kind of business ROI model that's going to make the long-term change in, in disparity. Um, so I think that's the model that we believe probably is going to be more effective in the long term, um, more so than the regulatory hammer uh, method. That's a great, great response. Um, I have a question that I'd, I'd like to give to Argy. I just want to make sure she's on. If, if not, I have a question um, for uh, Tom that I, I want to get his perspective on, on, uh, on one issue. Uh, but Argy, if you're on, I just have a question here. Uh, this is a question of the person says, I am a new employee working with the PCMH initiative in a hospital in New York. My role is to assist with the NCQA application process. What are some things that individuals new to the PCMH model can do to make sure the aims of PCMH are being met at their respective practice sites to the highest degree? I'm familiar with NCQA, PCPCC, and URAC. Are there any other resources I should be consulting for guidance and history uh, of this new model of care? Hi. Yes, I'm still here. Great okay, question. Great. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure you're going to be faced with many, many, many challenges as this is truly practice transformation at probably at its highest level. I would recommend that um, they participate in many of the NCQA sponsored um, seminars, webinars, training sessions um, that are held. They typically um, conduct those sessions throughout the U.S. Um, there's one that's coming up very soon um, in Chicago. Actually, it's going to be the very same week of the uh, PCPCC's meeting. Um, so I, I would suggest that um, going out to their website and certainly making uh, getting as much access to the information that's posted there, as well as going out to some of the trade organizations, the health trade organizations like Academy of the uh, um, the American Academy of Family Physicians, um, provide many many resources as well as the American College of Physicians. Um, so I would certainly recommend um, making use of those resources and then certainly sharing and um, providing an environment where there's much participation by the leadership there within her organization. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. So th this question is for uh, Dr. Luis and, and Sherry Wilson. A question about uh, where they see the field going um, as it relates to quality measurement and accreditation. In one of your slides, you clearly highlighted that the National Quality Forum has developed new measures in cultural competence and disparities. And uh, we see Joint Commission and CQA all doing work in this area. But yours is really the first tool that allows organizations to begin the measurement process that's linked to these efforts. Um, and I wondered if, if you felt like uh, we might see public reporting on these issues going forward and, and whether that would be beneficial. Absolutely. That's, that's, you know, what you're describing is kind of my ultimate dream is to be able to, to have a, a database where organizations can begin to med benchmark uh, themselves against peer institutions and against themselves. And uh, I, I think that would be fantastic if we actually got to that point. And, and that's one of the things that we're hoping to be able to make possible. Um, is, I think the PCMH tool, which I'm really excited about that tool, when the PCMH tool is available, I think it would really lend itself to that uh, because we'd be able to have a, get, get a large database hopefully pretty quickly because of the size of that, of that uh, number of practices. We'd be able to create a database where practices can benchmark themselves against like practices. They can benchmark against themselves, against um, other practices in their marketplace. Yeah, I think it'd be a, a, an exciting thing. And I'd also point out about that tool is that we there intend to go beyond cultural competency, but also to include, include health literacy and also patient experience in general. So the tool will allow you to get the, the CAP survey in addition to the cultural competency content, and in addition to that also has some information on, on um, 
on patient on health literacy among the patient population that I think could be able to may potentially help providers to have uh, a more immediate impact on individual patients even. Got it. That's yes. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Right. And also, too, yes, I'm hoping that we'll eventually move to the place of public reporting. I'm thinking from a pay for performance or a value based purchasing perspective. So, um, most healthcare organizations are already required to report out or publicly report the quality performance measures. And hopefully, with the implementation of the meaningful use of electronic health records, it will make this process easier. And being that now race, ethnicity, and language have to be collected as part of the meaningful use process, maybe eventually those quality performance measures will be stratified by race, ethnicity, and language and publicly reported. Again, I uh, refer back to the disparities dashboard that your center has put together and that I advocate with many of my colleagues is that you're already publicly reporting some of that information on your website. Wouldn't it be great if, as Dr. Levis mentioned, we had a national database for that? Mm -hmm. And as we move along and have metrics regarding this as well. So I'll say for language access, um, in the Quality Measures uh, Clearinghouse, uh, the Robert Johnson Foundation, they have a program speaking together where they developed five language access services metrics. And so I think that's another thing that we need as well. So now that you have these services in place, how effective are they? Are we providing quality? So I definitely hope we're moving in that direction. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee, question here. Healthcare reform is going to provide, and we've seen several articles in, in the lay uh, media about this, New York Times and others, uh, going to prov provide uh, financial incentives and resources to retail pharmacies to do more in the area of medication counseling and the like. Um, I'm just wondering, given that turn of events and, and what should seem like a wonderful driver for uh, the work that you do, have you seen an uptick in interest uh, in the education tool and, and uh, given particularly that there's this incentive now that's going to be kicking in? Yeah, actually one of the uh, main incentives for uh, interest in our tool uh, among medication therapy management was around the reimbursement. Mm -hmm. So you know, when a pharmacist gets you know, $50 to talk to a medication patient about the medication regimen, that does have a, add significant interest on that part. So I think having a financial, um, you know, support uh, it does definitely uh, make people more aware uh, that tools would allow them to reach this, these particular populations. Great. Uh, just a quick follow-up question. Somebody said, somebody asked uh, or mentioned that they're curious how, uh, and I'm going to direct this one to you, how you view the role of healthcare educators. Uh, and educational organizations in issues related to disparities in health literacy. Uh, I mean, I guess I would twist, uh, twist it and turn the question a bit to say, do you see those individuals uh, serving as an adjunct uh, to the tools that you develop? Uh, might there be a role for them uh, to use the tools as a way to uh, expedite workflow and, and any, whether you have any experience or thoughts in that area? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm kind of surprised that when I talk to people, a lot of people don't even know what health disparity or health literacy is. Mm -hmm. So the more that we can educate both our own profession and raise this as a national issue, I think anything that can do that uh, would be very, very beneficial. And how about uh, an even more uh, kind of a point of care? Uh, the, have you seen any health educators um, collaborating with uh, pharmacists and the like uh, serving as adjuncts and whether your tool might allow for that uh, team-based approach? Yeah, and actually we're working with uh, several organizations around specific topics. So whether it's uh, diabetes education to develop a, an education in PERMA uh, around type 2 diabetes and obesity and cardiovascular disease. So I think, and, and the other issue is making resources that are kind of standards that you know, would be available to lots of different individuals because every person who's an educator teaches a little bit differently and also being able to communicate in other languages is a major uh, challenge. So having those types of educational personnel, but supported by these types of technology, I think is the way that we really need to go. Fantastic. All right, well, we are drawing to a close here, and I want to thank uh, everyone for their participation uh, today. Uh, in particular, I want to thank, thank the PCPCC uh, and the center sponsoring the webinar, the Center for Care Delivery and Integration. I want to thank Audrey Wetzel uh, for her bringing her expertise and uh, her uh, co-moderating uh, this web seminar. Uh, with me, and I'd like to uh, particularly thank uh, Dr. Tom Levis, Cherie Wilson, and Dr. Charles Lee 
for what I certainly believe are absolutely cutting edge uh, tools that, uh, in my estimation, will be uh, part of the mainstream fabric of uh, healthcare quality equity uh, and ACOs in patient med center medical homes uh, in the hopefully uh, couple of uh, years to come. So very excited about what we've seen here today. There was a question related to for more information and cost, and I would urge anybody who's interested in learning more about these products to um, go on uh, both websites that were provided today, and I'm sure uh, they could provide you inf individual information about uh, cost structure and, and how these uh, tools are implemented and uh, deployed. Um, I want to thank everybody again for taking time out of their busy schedules. I want to put in one last plug for the PCPCC Fall Summit meeting in Chicago on October 26th. Uh, registration is available on pcpcc.net. And uh, I encourage anybody who's uh, interested in following these issues, again, to log on to uh, Dr. Luis's website, log on to Dr. Lee's website. Uh, perhaps you could sign in and, and be kept up to date on their activities. Certainly, uh, uh, we'd encourage anybody who's interested in disparities as well to log on to mghdisparitiesolutions.org to learn more about our work. And uh, I really appreciate everyone's time, and I thank the presenters for their partnership and uh, excellent work. I want to wish everybody a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all.